Good evening. Well, as the whole world now knows, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 34th President of the United States, is dead. He was shot near Dallas in Texas at 12.25 local time. That's about half past six hour time. In the car with him were Mrs. Kennedy, who was unhurt, and the governor of Texas, who was shot in the chest. A cameraman saw the president slump to the floor of the car with blood on his head. He heard Mrs. Kennedy cry, oh no, and then, kneeling by his body, he saw her try to lift her husband's head. The motorcade was immediately waved onto a side road, and within five minutes, President Kennedy was in hospital, but he never recovered consciousness, and 20 minutes later, he was dead. The shots were apparently fired from the corner window of a building near the road. The police found a 303 British rifle, three empty cartridge cases, and a wedge of paper that had apparently been used as a gun rest. The assassin's getaway car was later picked up in Fort Worth. Near the site of the assassination, the police found the bodies of a Secret Service man and a Dallas policeman, both of whom had been shot. The president's body was removed from the hospital an hour after he died. Mrs. Kennedy rode with the body. She appeared dazed and in a state of shock, but wasn't hysterical. The president's body will now be flown back to Washington, where it will lie in state in the White House. And some extra news which has come in since we started. A 24-year-old man, Lee H. Oswald, was arrested by Dallas police in connection with the murder of the policeman. He was taken screaming from a cinema. Police are questioning him to find out whether he's any connection with the murder of the president. A pistol was taken from Oswald after a scuffle. The police said Oswald told them, well, it's all over now. Another piece about Oswald, when arrested, Oswald was wearing ragged trousers and sports coats, five foot nine tall. In 1959, he defected to the Soviet Union. He returned to the United States last year with a Russian wife and child. He went to the Soviet Union following his discharge from the Marines and later informed the US Embassy in Moscow that he'd applied for Soviet citizenship. And another piece about the uh, late president's body. Mr. Kennedy's body is to lie in state tomorrow at the White House. The president's body is due in Washington at 11 o'clock GMT tonight. It'll be taken first to the Bethesda Naval Hospital. President Kennedy's two children, Carolyn, age five, and John, nearly three, have so far not been told of their father's death, the White House spokesman said tonight. He said the children were at the White House in the care of their nurse. President Johnson, as we must now call him, was sworn in at 1.30 p.m., which is 7.30 GMT. It was officially announced in Dallas today, and he took the oath aboard the presidential plane while it stood on Dallas Love Field, preparing to fly to Washington. Well, during the evening, we hope to be bringing you some reactions from people in the street here. But now over to Mike Scott for some world reactions. Well, messages from everybody in the world, from people all over the world, are pouring into Washington. Here are some of them. From our own Prime Minister, Sir Alec Hume, to President Lyndon Johnson, on behalf of the British government, I extend to you and the government of the United States of America our deepest sympathy in the terrible loss that you've sustained by the assassination of President Kennedy. He was greatly admired and loved by us all. I extend to you our assurance of friendship and support in the heavy burdens which have devolved upon you. From former Prime Ministers of England, from Sir Winston Churchill, the loss to the United States and to the world is incalculable. This monstrous act has taken from us a great statesman and a wise and valiant man. From Earl Attlee, he was a very fine young fellow and likely to do very great things, a man of great courage and vision. From the Earl of Av Avon, who used to be Anthony Eden, Young in experience, he said, but wise in heart. The whole free world will be mourning him. For Mr. Harold Macmillan, President Kennedy meant to so many people in every country understanding hope and faith in the future for the people of the United States. And from the Queen to President Lyndon Johnson, I'm shocked and horrified to learn of the tragic death of President Kennedy. On behalf of my people, I send my sincere sympathy to the government and to the Congress and to the people of the United States of America, signed Elizabeth R. She sent another telegram to Mrs. Kennedy. I am so deeply distressed to learn of the tragic death of President Kennedy. My husband joins me in sending our heartfelt and sincere sympathy to you and your family, signed Elizabeth R. From people within the world, the Soviet news agency TASS reported in Moscow that the president had died in hospital after an attempt was made on his life by persons believed to be among extreme right-wing elements. The Pope received the news of the president's death with dismay. The West German Chancellor Ludwig Erhard, the news fills the German people with deep grief. The French Prime Minister, Mr. Georges Pompidou, described the president's assassination as atrocious and frightful. And President de Gaulle said, President Kennedy died like a soldier under fire for his duty and in the service of his country. 
I've got dozens of others here. Uh, I've got a news You'll read flash them. There's something from Bill. A news flash does come in now. Uh, NBC News has said that Leo H. Oswald, the man the Dallas police arrested in connection with the murder of the policeman, has been identified as president of the Pro Castro Fair Play for Cuba Committee. While in the Soviet Union, he worked in a Minsk factory. Now then, have we any street interviews yet, do we know? We have street we interviews have. in that case. Well, I'm going to take you straight over to the streets outside these studios where people will give you their comments on the news of today. You can see from the paper tonight that President Kennedy was assassinated about four hours ago. Yes. What's your reaction to this? Well, it took my breath away at first. Actually, I couldn't figure it out why anybody would want to do such a thing to a bloke in his position. Actually, it just took all the wind out of me. I felt absolutely deflated about it. I mean, it just come out of here and it's uh, a real shock. Uh, well, we came out of the Palace Theatre and uh, we just thought it was a hoax. We thought somebody had printed some paper, someone was selling it to us as a hoax. Of course, it's, it seems to be a great pity that uh, President Kennedy and Mr. Cruz just seem to be getting down so well at the moment. But I couldn't believe it. I thought it was such a shock. I thought it was a hoax when I saw these newspapers. I think it would be a great loss to the world. I don't know what his wife and family must feel like. It must feel terrible. I'm quite sure it isn't a hoax. He is really dead. I can't believe it. I think it's a tragedy. Greatest tragedy since the war began, I'm sure. Yes, I hope it won't start another war. Of I was quite shocked because actually I'm not from England, I'm from Australia. And generally he was very well liked there and he had great support everywhere. I was very shocked. I still can't believe it that he's not there anymore. Bad thing, I think the person who ever shot him must have been a nutcase. There's no other word for him. I think it's, it's terrible what happened. I suppose uh, if we get somebody like Buddy Goldwater in, he might have us all blown up or something, you know. I can't believe it. Why should anybody do such a thing? The assassins and the would-be assassins of American presidents are an ill-assorted collection of men. It could be said that their shadow has hung over the presidency ever since George Washington took the first oath of office in 1789. But it was not until 1835, 128 years ago, that someone actually tried to kill a president. That someone was Richard Lawrence, a house painter who was obsessed with the belief that the president, Andrew Jackson, was withholding money from him. It was on a Friday that Jackson was walking in a funeral proces procession in Washington. Richard Lawrence fired two shots at the president, and he missed. Jackson lived on to die peacefully ten years later. But 30 years later, in 1865, the assassin didn't miss. His name was John Wilkes Booth. He was an actor, and he shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head at a Washington theater on the night of April the 14th. The death of Lincoln robbed America of a great man. In return, the life of John Wilkes Booth gave nothing to the country. Lincoln's assassination was the first of three consecutive murder attempts which succeeded. The second occurred in 1881 when President James Garfield was shot in the back as he was about to board a train at a Washington railway station. His executioner was Charles Guito, a member of the president's own political party who believed that Garfield's death was necessary to unite Republicans. In 1901, President William McKinley was shot in the chest at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. He died eight days later. Since then, and until now, the assassins have failed. Theodore Roosevelt was wounded in 1912 when a saloon keeper named Schrenk shot at him in Milwaukee. In 1933, Franklin D. Roosevelt na narrowly escaped death in Miami, Florida. An Italian bricklayer fired at him five times. He missed the president, but he killed the mayor of Chicago. And as the mayor lay dying by Roosevelt's side, he said to him, I'm glad it was me instead of you. President Truman had an attempt on his life as he was taking a nap in Blair House, Washington in November 1950. Two Puerto Ricans, in attempting to shoot him, killed two guards and wounded three others. Truman escaped this attempt and a second attempt later on when Puerto Ricans invaded the House of Representatives. Five congressmen were wounded, but none were killed. The final chapter, or the latest chapter in the American history of assassinations is yet to be completed. Bill Grundy. Well, we know about the event. What about its implications? With me are two people from Manchester University, Richard Rose next to me, who is a lecturer in government, and across from me, Marcus Cunliffe, who is professor of American history, with Marcus Cunliffe, his wife, Mitzi Cunliffe, who is herself an American. First of all, gentlemen, did 
Ken was it Kennedy who held the Democratic Party together? Ca and if it was, can uh, Lyndon Johnson do the same? Richard Rose? Um, no, the Democratic Party uh, has stuck together through thick and thin uh, for almost 100 years. But Kennedy was a good man to hold the Democratic Party together. And I think Lyndon Johnson is the same sort of man. The question is, of course, whether or not events themselves will make it more difficult, depending upon the kind of man who shot the president. Mm -hmm. this, this is one of the uh, enormously important points, isn't it? There must be hundreds of people sitting, uh, trying to uh, uh, guess the future now. But I think uh, if the uh, assassin is a man who has no connection with white racialist problems, this will obviously change a great deal. The, uh, internal uh, dissensions within the party if the killer uh, is or had been uh, a man who was a white extremist then this would have clearly raised enormous problems for Lyndon Johnson. Has the political detente, this relaxing of tension between Russia and the United States been largely Canada's doing? And again a, a follow-up question, uh, can the more conservative Lyndon Johnson uh, maintain this relaxation of tension? Um, no, in a sense Kennedy wasn't trying to relax the relationships between Russia and America. He was trying to strengthen America militarily, and probably the greatest single achievement of his administration was sorting out the mess that a general in the White House, Eisenhower, had left in the Pentagon. Uh, but I should think on past form, and given the enormous staff of very capable men that he has left behind them, that he brought to Washington, that Lyndon Johnson could negotiate as well, because the death of President Kennedy doesn't get the Chinese off Mr. Khrushchev's back. Yes, I would agree with this. Uh, I think that uh, if Kennedy had made a great difference, it would have perhaps been uh, in uh, helping in some way to dissipate the, the rabid atmosphere, the rabid looking for the communists under the bed sort of atmosphere. But this was, was going, I think, uh, in any case, before he came to power. It was a saner America in which Adlai Stevenson had played a part in, in, in creating or recreating can we leave politics for a moment? May I ask you, Mitzi, as an American, your own personal feelings about the events of today? I was reminded horribly and shatteredly of the way I felt when Roosevelt died, which was that every <coughs> American simply stood in the streets weeping, feeling that their father had died. And I suddenly realized with this horrible news today that one felt as if one's brightest young brother had died. Uh, he obviously was not um, the cut of... of, uh, uh, of um, Roosevelt, uh, who uh, was a, a bigger man, mm -hmm. but he certainly was enormously a real person and a very and a very big man. And one didn't realize um, when he was alive how much one counted on him personally to tie together mm. uh, national events and international affairs. I don't agree with Richard Rose that um, uh, history takes its own course. I think that w that the potting off uh, that has taken place of, of uh, large figures within the last uh, uh, 10 or 20 years has had an enormous mm. uh, shifting. Uh, force on history, and I think that this will, because for one thing, uh, Kennedy brought the intellectuals back to Washington right. for the first time since the early days of Roosevelt, and I have a feeling that they're all going to be going back to Harvard terribly soon, and to the disastrous um, result that um, yeah. the professionals will again be on the job for Which the worse. Do you think, in fact, that now that Britain is going to have to play a different and more important role in East-West relations, now that, well, at any rate, during Lyndon Johnson's early days? Well, um, I think, really, we've got to take this day by day, because before we came on the air, we assumed that the man who shot the president was uh, a white racialist. Mm -hmm. uh, the bulletin you read at the start of the program indicated that somehow he might be mixed up with the Soviet Union yeah, and with be, Cuba. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, if the man who shot the president was pro-communist, uh, this is going to create uh, an immediate crisis. Mm -hmm. And certainly Britain might step in as uh, an honest broker, as a go-between, and simply helping to, mm -hmm. to soothe things down. But we'll, we'll need to know more about Mr. Oswald. Is that a reasonable sort of analysis, Marcus? I think so, yes. I think uh, there are limits to what uh, Britain can realistically do. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a kind of passivity, a kind of lying midway between uh, a large tussle, uh, which I think ought not to become our task. And I think to this extent, we ought to be stimulated to think more actively than we have in the last mm -hmm. few years what is a positive role in world affairs. Uh, Truman, of course, was a man who nobody knew when Roosevelt died and became a very magnificent president indeed. Is Lyndon Johnson likely to be the same, do you think? 
I think this is a good bet, yes. I think the presidency, as, as people have said, is an ennobling office. The strain of authority mm. does um, often bring out the power in a man. And as we saw with uh, President Kennedy, it means that if he has any special uh, leaning, for example, if he were a Catholic, then he would have to be uh, doubly uh, determined, uh, self-consciously mm. determined not to appear to favor that particular group. The same thing, I think, might be said of Lyndon Johnson as a Southerner. Do you uh, feel the same, Richard? Well, one point I'd like to make that isn't perhaps appreciated in this country, that Lyndon Johnson was a great Senate majority leader, mm. one of the greatest politicians on Capitol Hill in a long time, and we can only hope and pray he'll be as good as a president. Well, this, in fact, uh, is the sort of question one, one must inevitably ask next. We've been talking about Lyndon Johnson, but in this country, at any rate, he's almost completely unknown. Who is Lyndon Johnson? The new president... Lyndon Johnson, the man who will hold the office of president until the end of Kennedy's original presidential term. A millionaire rancher from Texas, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Johnson was first elected to Congress in 1937. In 1948, he became senator for Texas, a position he has held ever since. Kennedy and Johnson were never very close friends, and as rivals for the Democratic nomination, the gap between them grew wider. The decision taken at the 1960 Democratic Convention in Los Angeles to run together was very much a marriage of convenience. Johnson, the leader of the Democratic majority in the Senate, was chosen to appease the southern states who might be expected to jib at the fact that Kennedy was both a Catholic and a liberal in racial matters. It was probably this influence in the South which gave Kennedy his narrow margin of victory. Commentators at the time forecast that this vital help would not be forgotten and would give Lyndon Johnson considerable influence in the affairs of the United States, but it didn't work out that way. And Lyndon Johnson, the new president of the United States, remains very much an unknown quantity. Bill. Well, soon after his inauguration in 1961, early 1961, uh, President Kennedy held a press conference. It was the first live televised press conference that we had seen. We have got some of the recording of that conference. Here, therefore, is an extract from that 1961 press conference in Washington, D.C. We're about to bring you the first of President John F. Kennedy's news conferences. This is being presented live for the first time. In previous years, presidential news conferences have been recorded and filmed, but never broadcast nor televised live. As we await the president, nearly 400 news correspondents representing the nation's news gathering organizations are seated here in the auditorium. When the president enters here, it is customary for the reporters to stand until invited by the president to be seated. Then the president himself will either have a statement to make or go directly to questions. For the question and answer period, each reporter will stand and when recognized by the president, ask his question. And for this first of President Kennedy's news conferences, there will be other innovations. Reporters are not being required to identify themselves. Also new for this conference is the absence of a time limit which has heretofore prevailed. Accompanying the president as he enters the auditorium will be Pierre Salinger, his news secretary, and Andrew Hatcher, the associate news secretary. White House correspondents who regularly cover the president are sitting there. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States. Good afternoon, won't you be seated? I have several uh, announcements to make first. I have a statement about the Geneva negotiations for an atomic test ban. These negotiations, as you know, are scheduled to begin early in February. They are of great importance, and we will need more time to prepare a clear American position. So we are consulting with other governments and are asking to have it put off until late March. As you know, Mr. John McCloy is my principal advisor in this field, and he has organized a distinguished panel of experts headed by Dr. James Fisk of the Bell Laboratories. And Mr. Salinger will have a list of the names at the end of the conference who are going to uh, study previous positions that we've taken in this field and also recommend to Mr. McCloy for my guidance uh, what our position will be in late March when we hope the uh, test will resume. Secondly, the United States government has decided to increase substantially its contribution towards relieving the famine in the Congo. This will be done by increasing the supply of cornmeal and dry milk.
press conference in 1961. As you may know, both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition have just been broadcasting to the country. In fact, the Right Honourable Hal Wilson, Leader of the Opposition, is in the North and has come down to our studio tonight. Mr Wilson, some questions because you were recently in America, but first of all, uh, your view as Leader of the Opposition, your view about, about these, the events of today. It's the same view as everyone else in this country, a sense of deep shock at this crime and uh, a desire, I think, to send, however inadequately, our sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and the family. I was speaking in North Wales tonight when the news came through and the shock that went through the big meeting that I was addressing, one felt as though they were stunned by the news. And um, it's too early yet to know what it's all about. But uh, it is going. He, he's going to be. His death can mean a tremendous loss for this country because he was a friend of this country and for the world. Now, in on your recent trip to America, you met President Kennedy. Yeah. What about your personal views now? Your personal recollections of him? of him? I was able to see a good deal of the way in which he uh, administered <coughs> the country because I know so many of his people. I've known many of them for years, and I was able to see how he was able to inspire them with a sense of mission, a sense of purpose, and to streamline the previously totally chaotic Washington machine, so that when a decision had to be taken, he was able to take it quickly and crisply, right or wrong, we all make mistakes, but uh, certainly it, it was a big change in the Washington machine. Talking to him, what one felt was a sense of quiet power. Undoubtedly, he had enormous power. He had a tremendous grip on the, every subject that you discussed. But he was quiet, he was informal, and you could talk just as informally as you and I could talk here. Was he a humorous man? Uh, yes, uh, very frank, and um, one or two slightly cynical observations. But uh, I won't say he was cracking a lot of jokes. We had a very serious talk after the political discussions. We walked around the garden a bit and just talked about other things, about his favourite historical reading and my favourite historical reading. We compared notes and found we had a number of joint favourites, especially in American history. Have you any personal recollections of the new president, the present president? No, president? I've seen very little of him. I've only seen him when I've been in the Senate uh, and, and through various uh, mutual acquaintances. I've shaken hands with him, had a short talk with him. But they are, of course, two very different people. Uh, I only came into this studio just towards the end of the previous discussion, and I, I very much agree that he, it was a marriage of convenience at the last Democratic Convention. One just doesn't know what changes there will be now. Perhaps uh, President Johnson, it's hard to start using this phrase, will try and carry on part of the administrative machine and part of the ideas that Kennedy left behind. But there are bound to be differences, and I think they will accumulate fairly quickly. Can I ask you a question that I asked Marcus Kandak and Richard Rose? Is he likely to be, from your very brief meeting and very rapid assessment of him, is he likely to be another Truman? You mean uh, a, a, a man who suddenly ri who rises yes. with the job? He could be. His background, like Truman's, is a highly political background, by which I mean American politics, uh, the democratic machine. Uh, he has shown on occasion great humanity, great understanding. We can only hope that he will like Truman, rise with the job, and his associate, and that his association with President Kennedy will mean that he has some of the same sense of mission and the same desire to bring some order and some peace out of East-West relations. As a potential Prime Minister of this country, Mr Wilson, what do you think Britain's role will be in the period when Lyndon Johnson is finding his feet much stronger, much more involved in East-West in East relations? It's too early to say, and of course we don't know enough yet about the motive for the crime, if there was a motive for this crime. Uh, that might of itself create new relationships, new difficulties, <coughs> new problems, perhaps very grave ones. And uh, it's essential that Britain be ready to help in any way. But I think any suggestion, particularly on the, the very day of the tragedy, that Britain was uh, hoping to uh, take on greater power, greater influence because of this tragedy, I think would be very much resented. I hope we'll show by our sympathy, by our understanding, that the death of President Kennedy is a personal loss to us as well as to every American. I hope we'll show that we're prepared to do anything that is reasonable to help East-West relations and, if possible, stand between them and Russia if there are increased difficulties arising out of it. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Well, now, 
In uh, the summer of this year, President Kennedy, who was only two generations removed from his Irish ancestors, went back to Ireland and there held a very pleasant, very amusing and totally informal conference with people at Wexford where his ancestors had come from. Here's a bit of that conference. Mr. Mayor, I first of all uh, would like to introduce two uh, members of my family who came here with us. My sister Eunice Shriver. And to introduce uh, another of my sisters, uh, Jean Smith. And I'd like to have you meet the American ambassador, McCluskey, who's with us, right over there. And I'd like to have you meet the head of the American labor movement, whose mother and father were born in Ireland, George Meany, who's traveling with us. And then I'd like to have you meet the only uh, man with us who doesn't have a drop of Irish blood, but who's dying to. The head of the protocol in the United States, Angia Biddle Duke. I'm uh, glad to be here. It took 115 years to make this trip. And 6,000 miles. And three generations. But I'm uh, proud to be here. And I appreciate the warm welcome you've given to all of us. When uh, my great-grandfather left here to become a uh, cooper in East Boston, he carried uh, nothing with him except two things. A strong religious faith and a strong uh, desire for liberty. And I'm glad to say, and I'm glad to say that all of his great grandchildren have valued that inheritance. If he hadn't left, I'd be working over at the Albatross Company. <laughs> or perhaps for John D. Kelly. In, in any case, we're happy uh, to be back here. About uh, 50 uh, years ago, an Irishman from New Ross uh, traveled down to Washington with his family. And in order to tell his neighbors how well he was doing, he had his picture taken in front of the White House and said, this is our summer home. <laughs> Come and see us. Well, it's our home also in the winter. And I hope you will come and see us. Thank you. What a delightful picture at press conference in summer of this year. We've just got some more news flashes. The President's body has now arrived in Washington, where it will lie in state in the White House tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Ludwig Erhardt, West German Chancellor, has cancelled his planned visit to Washington next week, where he was to have conferred with President Kennedy, and he sent telegrams of sympathy to Mrs. Kennedy and President Johnson. Uh, another one, Herr Willy Brandt, Mayor of West Berlin, said, Berlin had lost its best friend with the death of the first citizen of the world, and he added, a flame has been extinguished for everyone, hoping for a just peace and a better life. The world has become much poorer this evening. We, the newspapers of the world, of course, are full of the news. We have a little film now uh, of the newspapers, and then Mike Scott will be showing you those that have come into this studio. We've already got tomorrow's newspapers. Judging by this film, so have a lot of other people. Uh, they all have the same sad tale to tell. I'll read, I'll read you some of the headlines from the ones I got in the studio whilst you look at this. The Daily Herald headlines, sniper strikes as he tours race hate state, and then in big block capital letters, 
Kennedy assassinated. Anguish Jackie cradles him in her lap as he dies. The Daily Telegraph, Kennedy assassinated, shot in the head in open car on Texas Festival Drive. Daily Express, Kennedy is dead, car ambushed. Daily Mirror, Kennedy is assassinated. Jackie threw her arms round him and cried, oh no. The Guardian, President Kennedy assassinated, shot beside wife in open car. And the Mail, as everybody else, Kennedy assassinated. I'd like to read you a little from the editorial of the Mail because I think it says, it sort of sums things up in a way. Uh, it says, there are moments of historical disaster which are so shocking in their character and far reaching in their effects as to defeat adequate human expression. The assassination of President Kennedy is one of these. I don't think there's anything more to say from tomorrow's papers. One final bit of news. I think from 9 a.m. tomorrow, Saturday, there will be reports from America by Telstar. And that's all from us. In a few moments' time, there will be an epilogue. The story as the romance of modern life. Other political leaders have been men in middle age or old men. But here was one who looked almost a youth with a very beautiful wife and two little children. This family surely was the symbol of the hopes and aspirations of youth in the modern world. In these first hours of tragedy, our thoughts go out in loving sympathy to this wife and to these little children on their grievous bereavement. President Kennedy was a Christian man, and those who in any manner share his Christian faith will, besides their sympathy, wish to say a prayer for his soul. We pray that after his life of devotion to duty and his work for peace and racial equality, that God in his loving kindness will give him eternal rest. Come to his assistance, every saint of God. Go out to meet him, every angel of God. Take his soul and offer it in the sight of God's majesty. May Christ, who has called you away, take you to himself, and may angels lead you into Abraham's bosom. Take his soul and offer it in the sight of God's majesty. Eternal rest give unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. Lord, have mercy. Christ of mercy, Lord of mercy. Let us pray. Absolve, we beseech thee, O Lord, the soul of thy servant from every bond of sin, that he may live again in the glory of the resurrection and breathe the air of paradise among thy saints and elect through Christ our Lord. May the angels lead him into paradise. May the martyrs await his coming and bring him into the holy city, the heavenly Jerusalem. May a choir of angels welcome him, and with the poor man Lazarus of old, may he enjoy eternal rest. Amen. <laughs>